Hello, and thank you for joining our third annual Day with DESA. Before the session gets started, let's go over a few things. A copy of the presentation will be available to download once the session has ended under the materials section. If you have questions about the information in this session, enter them in the Q&A section below and the speaker will answer them once the session has ended. If we don't get to your question, we'll reach out to you at the end of the conference. If you have questions about the topics or trends that are mentioned throughout Day with DESA and how they pertain to your company, and you'd like to reach out to one of our team members directly, hit the chat icon at the bottom of daywithdesa.com and you'll be connected directly with one of our team members. Thank you for attending live. Each of our live attendees is eligible for our prize drawing at the end of the conference. And each session that you attend live increases your chances of winning either a Nintendo bundle or a brand new iPhone 12. Finally, I'd like to take this time to thank all of our sponsors for their participation today with DESA. Specifically, I'd like to call out CRL, our title sponsor for three years running. We'd like to thank our platinum sponsors, Orisure, Quest Diagnostics, Samba Safety, and Psychomedics. All of our sponsors' support is greatly appreciated. With that, let's get started. Enjoy your session. Hello, and thank you so much for joining us for another session of Day with DISA. Today, we're going to be talking about background litigation strategies, and we're super excited to welcome back Pam Devada. She's the partner over at Cypher Shaw, where she deals with all things background screening. Pam, thank you so much for joining us again. Thanks for having me. Of course. And a little bit of housekeeping before we dive in. Uh, if you want a copy of the presentation, it'll be available at the, end of the at the end of the session. You'll be able to click on the materials section at the bottom right, and you'll be able to download a copy there. If you have a question throughout the session, please just pepper it into that Q&A box at the bottom right. And uh, at the end of the session, we'll answer all of those questions. If we're unable to get to a question, uh, we will reach back out to you after the conference. With that being said, thank you so much and uh, take it away. Thanks so much. So thrilled to be back with everyone today. Um, and today we're really going to talk a little bit in more detail about um, background screening litigation strategies. Um, as we talked about earlier, if you went to my earlier presentation in the week, we talked a little bit from a high level in terms of hot topics in background screening. Today we're going to focus really on some of the items as it relates to the hot topics of litigation and what you can do to protect yourself. Um, as Tom said, I'm a partner um, at Cypher Shaw in Chicago. Um, nothing that I'm saying today is, should be construed as legal advice or counsel. Um, even though I am an attorney, please don't hold that against me. Um, and so why don't we go ahead and dig in right now because we have a lot of things to cover and I know everyone's time is really valuable. So what are we really talking about today? We're going to talk about some litigation strategies specifically about the Fair Credit Reporting Act and some of the EEOC criminal history guidance and what you need to do to protect yourselves, specifically as employers who are utilizing background checks in making employment decisions. Um, there's a many different laws that we deal with from the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act to, e to the EEOC criminal history guidance to the ban the box regulations. Um, some of these things we covered on some of the hot topics, but today we're gonna focus on your responsibilities under the law and some tips to make sure that you understand how, if you do get sued, for example, um, how you can defend against those lawsuits specifically. Um, so one of the things that we're really gonna start with and talk about is your responsibilities under the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act. So if you remember, the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act is the statute that was passed way back um, in 1970 um, and it's been amended multiple times. Um, it has been one of the statutes where we have seen an increased amount of litigation uh, really over the past decade. Um, and, and I would say exponentially so in the last three or four years, starting back in 2015 a little bit and then it really gained speed. So under the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act, employers such as people on, the, on this webinar um, really have four main responsibilities that you need to understand. And you can be sued for any of these. 
Um, so that's when we're really talking about them so you know how to protect yourself to make sure that you're not running afoul of this law. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about the EEOC criminal history guidance and what you need to do when you're making those uh, employment decisions and then we're gonna talk about best practices. So the first thing that you need to do before you make sure that you um, are complying with the law is you must have a permissible purpose under the law for running a background check. Um, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, right, there's a whole section under Section 604 or 1681B that talks about the fact that a background screening company can only provide certain information about a person, right, for privacy rights, for example, um, for certain different permissible purposes. Generally speaking, when you are hiring someone or you're thinking about promoting them, you've got the permissible purpose of employment. Other permissible purposes would be, for example, for insurance purposes, for um, determining whether or not to issue credit, right? A lender, for example, for a mortgage or a loan, um, or if you are looking at an account, for example, um, for tenant screening or for um, something to do with volunteer purposes. Um, but what we really want to focus on today is this employment purpose. And what's interesting about this prong is that the Federal Trade Commission has opined that a permissible purpose for employment purposes not only encompasses our traditional employment that we would think about when you're hiring someone, but they have absolutely said that it also applies to independent contractors as well as volunteers. And the reason that that's really important is because, you know, obviously with the gig economy, with lots of different companies utilizing a 1099 workforce in terms of independent contractors, you may be wondering whether or not this law applies to you if you're going to be running a check on these individuals. As it relates to what the federal regulator, one of the two, the CFPB is one of them, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and the Federal, Fair Trader, federal Trade Commission, they have opined that again, an employment purposes, uh, permissible purpose really is going to, um, going to bleed over to independent contractors and volunteers. And the reason why that's important is because depending on your permissible purpose, that is going to then uh, determine the other responsibilities under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And so this slide really talks about if you are using um, background reports for an employment purpose. Uh, the other thing I wanna make sure that you note on that is that the issue is going to be that there are some state, excuse me, there's some district courts, um, really four decisions that we've seen so far, where there's an argument that an independent contractor does not meet the definition of an employment purpose. Um, and so you really want to make sure you understand, in addition to the, you know, whole host of wage and hour laws and classification issues that you're dealing with, with um, specifically in California and throughout the United States, um, on classification of whether somebody's an employee or an independent contractor, you understand um, what laws apply and what uh, interpretation you're going to take. Um, it's also important because we're going to talk about in a little bit some of the ban the box laws. And some of the ban the box laws are very clear that they don't only deal with employees um, or applicants, for example, but they also deal with independent contractors. Um, like New York City is one of them. So you, you need to understand that. So let's assume for the purpose of your responsibilities under the FCRA, that you have an employment purpose, okay? So you're running a background check through a third party, um, either for hiring someone or for um, hiring them to perform services as an independent contractor, and you have made the determination that they fall under an employment purpose. Um, the next responsibilities you're going to have is to have a standalone disclosure and a written authorization. We're gonna talk about that in more detail in a few minutes, because frankly, that's where most of the litigation is. We're gonna to talk to you a little bit about what types of claims we're seeing and what you can do to make sure that you protect yourself from being that low hanging fruit in that litigation. Um, the third responsibility is that you have a adverse action process. And it's really a three-step process with a pre-adverse action letter, a waiting period, and then your adverse action. Um, that we're gonna go into some more detail as well because there are some very easy tips. Um, I call them the no good deed goes unpunished tips to make sure that you're 
uh, recruiters and your hiring managers understand what the law says. Um, and even if you've got a policy and a process, um, which obviously is, is step one, right? Um, if that's not being consistently followed, you're gonna potentially have a problem um, as well. Um, and then the fourth thing under the law, under the FCRA, is that you must give a promise or a certification to your background screening company that you are gonna meet these three things, the permissible purpose, that you have obtained a disclosure and gotten an authorization past tense, that you will follow the adverse action process, and that you're gonna follow all equal employment opportunity laws, which obviously as an employer, you're gonna to have to follow anyway, like Title VII and the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, et cetera. Um, but that usually, that certification is usually done in one of two ways. It's usually done in a um, agreement that you have with your background screening company. But you might also find that anytime you order a background check, that you are recertifying that information. If you ever wondered why, it's because background screening companies and consumer reporting agencies, as they're generally called under the FCRA, they have their own set of responsibilities and they're getting sued when they don't get this certification because it's a responsibility that they have to get from you. So you might see every time you order um, that you may have to recertify that information. So why does this matter? The reason why we're so focused on the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act is because litigation has exploded in the last few years. And frankly, the damages can be dire. Um, sometimes they can be bet the company cases. Um, other times they can be millions and millions of dollars of potential exposure. And you want to be really careful about understanding um, what you can do to prevent these types of claims. So we're going to talk in detail about some of the steps that you can go through to mitigate your risks. Um, one of the main steps that, that you can go to is to prevent what's called a willful violation, right? So there's two types of different um, violations under the law. And if you were in our earlier session a couple of days ago, um, we talked a little bit about the fact that you could be sued for a negligent noncompliance violation where you know, generally in a negligence claim is you had a duty and you breached that duty. Um, those are generally single plaintiff claims, one person, one-off claims. Um, for example, you didn't follow the adverse action procedure correctly one time um, and um, you didn't give the individual or you didn't give the individual a copy of the disclosure form, but your normal practice is to do so and it was an aberration. Well, that person can get actual damages. So if they didn't get the job, for example, or if they have emotional distress in some jurisdictions, um, and then they can also get attorney's fees. And I have to tell you, attorney's fees are really important because this is what's called a fee shifting statute. So what that means is plaintiffs counsels make their living of suing employers and suing consumer reporting agencies, specifically um, many plaintiffs counsels in this industry don't believe that background checks should be utilized um, and or that criminal history should be taken into consideration in hiring decisions whatsoever. And so there's a lot of um, not only these negligent violations, but really the, the, in my opinion, the more important, which is this alleged willful violation. So what does that mean? A willful violation is when you are alleged to have um, reckless disregard for the law. So you know the law and you just decided to disregard that. That's at least the Supreme Court standard in the Safeco case. Um, and the reason why that's important is because, number one, there's a lot of litigation right now under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And so gone are the days where these are new cases, but we don't have a lot of learnings and you can stick your head in the sand and pretend that you don't know what's going on. Um, a willful violation is when you knew or should have known, for example, and you did nothing about it um, to change your, um, you know, to change your disclosure and authorization forms or to follow the adverse action, for example, or um, to, you know, you, you had a process or didn't have a process or a policy, um, or you failed to, um, for example, um, comply with another component of the law. The reason why this is important is because 
again, someone could get actual damages, but more often than not, in a class action, nobody alleges actual damages. Because if they do, then I can come in or another defense counsel can come in and say, no, your damages are all individualized. So Susie versus Tom's versus Sally's are all different and individualized. It's not right for a class action. Um, but if you have statutory damages or statutory penalties, for example, of $100 to $1,000 per violation, then everybody's damages are the same. And the problem with that then is that it's much, you just need one person to allege that you are in violation and that your policy and practice is in violation of the law. And all of a sudden they can have a class of hundreds or thousands or tens or hundreds of thousands of people. And because the statute of limitations under the law is earlier from two years or five years, you need to understand that you may have tail liability, for example, um, if you haven't changed your forms or if you haven't changed your process or your policies. And so you really need to do that. Um, what we have seen, unfortunately, recently is that um, some of the courts that have been looking at these cases have basically said, well, you should have known um, even before we came out with this pronouncement, you should have known and therefore you're going to go back and we're going to hold that you were willful in your noncompliance. The other piece I just want to mention is this attorney's fees piece. Because it's a fee shifting statute, we've got plaintiff's counsels who will litigate these cases and, and come up with hundreds of thousands of dollars of attorney's fees. And even if it's a, a per se violation, these are hyper technical statutes, right? It is the difference between a semicolon and not a semicolon uh, on a disclosure form. Again, that's, that's a specific case in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So you really wanna be very careful about knowing what you're doing and not um, assuming, for example, that something that was in effect six months ago is still current. Or for example, relying on a third party. It's wonderful to partner with your background screening companies um, like DISA, for example, but understand you are on the hook as it relates to any claims um, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, you're gonna be on the hook. So you really wanna make sure you understand um, what your obligations are under the law. So let's talk a little bit about those four obligations we discussed. We already talked about permissible purpose. So the next one where we see the most litigation is under the disclosure and authorization. So what does the law require? Um, number one, disclosure claims are on the rise. Um, and, and these are the biggest, I, I'm gonna just tell you, these are the, I would say perhaps the most common type of FCRA claim we see. We see um, hundreds of claims per year. Um, they are often in California, although not always. Um, we see hot spots of litigation in Virginia, in Pennsylvania, and in Florida, um, in addition to California. Um, we also see these claims being brought in state court. The Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act, even though it's a federal statute, um, has what's called concurrent jurisdiction. So you could have, for example, a class action brought in Iowa on behalf of a nationwide group of individuals and that claim may stay in Iowa State Court. Now there's lots of procedural things that we can do as your lawyers to remove that up to federal court, but unfortunately there's a whole line of cases and we're not really talking about it too much today, um, but there's a line of cases talking, it's called the Spokio, Robbins versus Spokio case um, that came out a couple of years ago um, that basically talked about when somebody had standing to bring a case, they had to have concrete harm and particularized injury. And you may be asking, wait a second, if I gave a document, how can that document cause somebody harm, right? How can that cause somebody particularized injury if they got the job? Um, and unfortunately, what we're seeing is more and more of these class action cases are being brought not by people that you hire, not by people that you didn't hire, right? But by people that you actually hired, your employees that have a hyper-technical violation of the law and they're claiming that the information you gave them caused them an informational injury or a privacy harm. So the statute requires that you provide 
to the individual a disclosure that you're going to be running a background check. Um, that disclosure must consist solely of the disclosure. That's the language in the statute that a background check or consumer report must be maybe obtained. Um, the problem is it needs to be clear and conspicuous. But in the next statement in the statute, what the uh, drafters of the FCRA did was say, you also need a written authorization. And oh, by the way, the authorization and the disclosure can be part and parcel of the same. They can be the same document, which of course is very challenging because how can it be standalone and separate or required to be, and then also be part of the same document? This is why we've got so much litigation on this. So what do you need to do to protect yourselves in terms of litigation avoidance? The big litigation tip is make sure that you review your forms at least on an annual basis. Remember when I talked about willfulness, right? Unfortunately, what the courts have said is if you put your head in the sand and you don't keep abreast of the law, you could be potentially liable for a willful violation. Um, and one thing that we didn't spend a lot of time on is the difference between the willful violation. We talked about the fact that, remember, you can have statutory damages, you can have attorney's fees, and punitive damages. So punishment or punitive damages. Um, and again, this becomes very, very um, important because the plaintiff's bar uses this to embolden settlements and to argue that you are going to have large jury verdicts, for example, um, which, which, by the way, um, happens um, sometimes. So understand that. So what do you need to do? Well, number one, you need to make sure that not only do you review your forms on at least an annual basis, but you need to strip out anything that's not required under the law. Anything that is extraneous is going to be challenged. Um, we have seen, you name it, we've seen it. So if you have a signature on the form, that potentially is going to be challenged. It, it is not generally, I've never heard of a court that has held that, but somebody could. Um, references to inspections of files or notice of scope of investigative consumer reports potentially are not allowed or could be declared as um, violative. You should really make sure if you're doing investigative consumer reports like reference checks, personal or professional references, that you have a separate disclosure. Um, so for example, you're gonna have your disclosure form, an investigative consumer report disclosure form, a separate California disclosure, and then an authorization form. Um, so understand that is going to be um, a lot of different forms for someone to have, of course, but you do wanna make sure that you are um, understanding the different set of forms that are gonna be required so things like, for example, um, having references to throughout someone's employment could be extraneous. You can have that in the authorization, but you really don't want to have that in the disclosure form because it might be challenged. Um, state laws are very, very uh, important because while you do have to comply with all of the different state laws and local jurisdiction issues, if you put that information in the disclosure form itself, Someone can argue that that is not separate, standalone, clear, or conspicuous. And that is the threshold level that a court is going to be looking at. What most companies decide to do is they take those responsibilities and requirements, because you have to have them to comply with these other state laws, and you either put them with the authorization or you put them in a separate notice called other state law notices, for example. You really want to make sure that your disclosure is as short and sweet and succinct and concise as it can possibly be. You can have a reference to an employment purpose and frankly, under California law, you must in the California disclosure, um, but you can have it in your federal disclosure um, as well. And so remember, you're gonna have multiple different forms that you're likely going to be supplying and providing to your applicant or to your employee. You also wanna make sure the timing is really important. So while you can provide this with your hiring or application documents, you don't wanna bury it in the middle of these documents. That's not going to be clear and conspicuous. Having the disclosure be at the very front end of the packet of documents, you know, and having page numbers that say page one of one, end of document, 
on a document, for example, and not put into the um, text of something. You know, a lot of companies have online um, applicant tracking systems or HRIS systems, for example. You wanna really make sure that if you do that, you know what it looks like, right? Whether you're utilizing a candidate entry system that is from a third party, right? Whether it's an applicant tracking system or whether it's your background screening company's third party system, you really wanna make sure you know what it looks like. Test it, stress test it, pressure test it to make sure that these are separate and apart um, so that you are getting the benefit of making sure that you have the very best arguments. Um, and the authorization does not need to be separate from the other employment documents and the authorization does not necessarily need to be separate from the disclosure. But again, to protect yourself from litigation, having the most separate and distinct documents, page breaks, breadcrumbs, page numbers, all of these different things are going to be very helpful in making the argument, not only that they're separate and apart, but that it's clear and conspicuous information. We're now going to turn to adverse action, which is the third requirement that we talked about under the Fair Credit Reporting Act and where we're seeing sort of the litigation. Just as a very quick reminder, adverse action is, is generally um, very broadly construed. And so what you have to do is um, a couple of things, right? You have to take your pre-adverse action notice before you take adverse action, where you give the person a copy of the report, a summary of rights, and then different band of box or state or local notices, sometimes you have to give the reason for taking action. Here's what we see litigation. Uh, number one, we see um, where somebody, for example, calls up the person and they say, um, by the way, you're going to be getting something in the mail. Um, you have a problem with your background check. You're going to be giving, getting something in the mail. Well, while you provided that information, um, if they say you have a problem with your background check, or you're not gonna be able to start on Monday. I call this the Friday, Monday situation, right? You get a background check on Friday and it shows something horrendous, but that person is not gonna be able to come in and do their orientation on Monday morning, for example. Well, the second responsibility here is you have to wait a reasonable period of time before you take adverse action, like due process. So if you've got your pre-adverse action, then you wait a reasonable period of time and then you take adverse action, if on a Friday you get the background check and you call the person up and you say, hey, Sally, there's a problem with your background check. You can't come in Monday. That sounds an awful lot like adverse action. And you haven't given them a copy of the report. You haven't given them the reasonable waiting time period here that we're talking about. So the Federal Trade Commission has opined that a reasonable period of time is five business days. You may not have five business days. So what are some uh, considerations that you want to make sure that you focus on in terms of litigation avoidance? Um, you know, are you going to mail it or are you going to email it? Emailing the pre-adverse action is perfectly appropriate as long as you do so um, in a secure manner, right? You want to make sure that your consumer report or your background report has your PII, your personal identifiable information truncated. Um, so your date of birth or your social security information, you want to make sure that that's truncated. But that's going to make it easier and faster, right, if you email that information, number one. Um, number two, you want to make sure that, for example, um, do you want to go ahead and send that pre-adverse action letter and have the person call you or communicate with you so that you can actually talk to them about what is in their background report? Um, that's often a really good idea to do. Um, and then you need to make sure that you consider your local jurisdictional requirements, um, what that time frame is. Um, if you are going to contract this out to your background screening company, make sure you understand um, what happens. So for example, oftentimes you push a button and you say, initiate pre-adverse action. But then somebody might call you and they may say to you, listen, I, I uh, got my pre-adverse action letter. Let me tell you about all the different reasons why I should still be considered for this job. Um, they might also dispute the information. That's the process of working. Um, if they dispute the information, what they're saying to you is, and they're saying to their background screening company, the information is incorrect or incomplete. So maybe it's, um, there shows that they have a felony on their report and really it's a misdemeanor or it's a different Sally Smith, for example. And so you wanna be really careful about that. 
before you take adverse action. The next step is then taking adverse action um, and you communicate that final decision, for example, um, with all of these different myriads of things. So where do we see this um, breaking down in terms of litigation? Well, number one, where some well-meaning recruiter or hiring manager says, well, can't we just smush this all into one letter? You see that all the time. You cannot. It needs to be this sort of three-step, pre-adverse action, waiting period, adverse action. Um, if you've hired the person and you remove them from the job, for example, that could be deemed adverse action. So you're going to want to pay them, which is why, as a best practice to prevent litigation, you want to make sure of a couple things. One, don't start the person. And or when you give your conditional offer of employment, don't put a date for their start date. Because if the background check doesn't come back or you don't have five business days or whatever the requisite period of time is, that could be a problem. So what do you want to do there? Put in your offer letter that it is the offer is contingent on successfully completing the background check or any other pre-employment inquiries. Be careful, there's some laws about those as well. But if you say it's contingent upon successful completion of the background check, then you don't give a start date. So if you give a start date too soon in the background check, you, you know, you're going to take adverse action, that does become very problematic. Um, and for goodness sake, please don't start the person because then if you have to um, take them out, it's so much more expensive, right? It's bad for morale. They have already had access to your property, to your people. They've probably already quit another job, for example. And so now they can argue that they have detrimentally relied on the fact that the background check was passed because you started them, um, it becomes a lot more difficult to terminate someone um, and still comply with the adverse action procedures. Um, the other thing is you either have to make the choice of you keep them in the job for five days and pay them, but now you have someone who is, you know, perhaps um, has had some terrible conviction that you really do not believe that they're fit for the job, which is why you're thinking about taking adverse action. Um, or you have to let them go home and then you have to pay them. And neither of those are really um, wonderful um, alternatives, which is why don't start the person before and, and make sure you have that um, to do. Um, and again, make sure all of this is done in writing. It's imperative that you train the people who are looking at your background screens to understand the adverse action requirements. There are so many state and local nuances and so many issues um, that become very, very um, problematic that you really want to make sure you understand, they understand what they're allowed to do um, and what they're not allowed to do as it relates to adverse action. Uh, the next topic we're going to talk about is also very important for the training piece, which is what in the world someone needs to do when they get a criminal history specifically um, in terms of how they analyze that information. So we're going to talk about the EEOC's criminal history guidance and, and what's required under the law. And this is why it's really important that those people that are making these decisions are trained and understand not only the nuances of, you know, when I get a background check in, what am I looking at? What am I allowed to do? What am I not allowed to do? but also understanding then what letters to send out. How, you know, can I start the person? Can I not start the person? What happens if somebody disputes or provides me information? All of those things are really important. So one tip that we have is having a centralized background screening process. Whether it is one person or a group of people, it's really important to consider making sure that you have um, that centralized focus group who can keep up because the laws really do move. They're a moving target. So let's talk a little bit about um, what you do when you get a background report in and, and um, what this EEOC criminal history guidance talks about. So first of all, the EEOC enforcement guidance came out back in 2012, and you'll see the title here. It's, um, it's We generally call it the criminal history guidance, but it's Consideration of Arrest and Conviction Records in Employment Decisions under Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Um, and, and what this guidance is, number one, it is not a statute. Number two, it is not a regulation. So it doesn't have the full force and effect of either of those, but be very, very careful. This is 
the EEOC, right? This is the administrative agency that is charged with ensuring that the civil rights laws are followed. And so to the extent, for example, um, that you are not complying with the guidance, and we're gonna talk about some very, very recent consent decrees and some litigation um, that you can understand how to avoid this. Um, we're seeing this happen, even though this is still, you know, now it's eight years old. Um, I remember the day vividly when it came out and where I was, um, you know, I think we, we did like, 300 webinars that year <laughs> uh, in, in a very short time span, uh, one every day, frankly, um, because it was such a sea change. So the basis for this guidance is, is basically, look, employers are using criminal history in making employment decisions. And the national data, according to the EEOC, supported that certain minority groups, so African-American individuals, Hispanic, and men, were all incarcerated more frequently, for example, and arrested more frequently um, than other people outside of those groups. And so the argument is, it's not disparate treatment. You're not treating someone differently based on a protected class, um, wherein you are doing it intentionally, right? Instead, the, the idea is what's called disparate impact. And so the argument is, you may have a neutral policy for example, we don't hire felons, but that that policy that's neutral on its face has a disproportionate or disparate impact on certain minority groups. And that is an actionable claim under Title VII. And so we see this quite often. So how do you avoid litigation? And we'll go and talk about the best practices. Number one, have a written policy. Um, this is not form over substance, but you know, the EUC may disagree with what your ultimate decision is, but if you have a policy in place that writes out what you are doing, that is going to be crucial. Same thing with your background screening policy. You should have a policy that talks about your background screening process and, and policy that talks specifically about who you're running background checks on, how you're running background checks, your compliance with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, your compliance with the EEOC guidance and what you are analyzing. So the EEOC basically talked about um, the three uh, green factors. This is a case called Green versus Missouri Pacific Railroad um, from the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals that said, the EEOC said, listen, if you have a targeted screen and you are looking at things like the age of the offense, for example, and you're looking at things like um, you know, is it job related, for example, to the position, um, then you likely are going to be able to defend against the fact that there's sort of this um, disparate impact discrimination. Um, but then it said, look, in addition, you really should be doing a case by case assessment each and every time you are looking at an individual. And what that's called is an individualized assessment. Now, um, one of my uh, friends and colleagues who was a commissioner and who was still a commissioner at the time was able to basically say there are some circumstances that are so intertwined that you don't have to do an individualized assessment. So, for example, the examples and the guidance are, you know, there's a, um, you're hiring for a child care facility and or child care uh, position and the person has a conviction against a child or you're working in a pharmaceutical company and the person has a um, distribution um, conviction, for example, um, for drug manufacture and distribution. That's when you don't need to do an individualized assessment. But in all other circumstances, really the best practice is to do so. And these are the factors that you really need to look at. So, you know, the facts and circumstances surrounding the offense. Is the individual bonded by a government entity? How old was the person at the time of the conviction or release of prison? Is it, you know, were they older and they should have known better or were they 18, 19, or 20? Um, evidence that that person performed the actual same job that they're going to be performing for you with a different employer and they didn't have any incidents of any criminal conduct or any problems. Um, rehabilitation efforts and their consistency with employment, for example, um, is this an aberration? Is this a one-time offense? Did they make a mistake and have a very bad day? Or is this a history and a pattern of poor judgment over time? All of those things are going to need to be looked at. And so it's really important that you 
have your written policy and, and write this down, right? Make sure you understand that the person that you're looking at who is in one state versus a different state, you're treating with consistency um, so that you can defend against a claim of disparate impact. And we're really seeing these claims more and more this year. Um, they, they were sort of um, a little quiet um, in 2017, 2018, and then we saw a really big increase um, the past couple of years. Um, so let me talk about a recent consent decree that happened just last year with the EEOC, this nationwide um, retailer who had this allegation of disparate impact against um, black applicants. Um, so this was an applicant, the situation that gave rise to this charge of discrimination was an applicant was denied um, employment. They had a six-year-old drug possession conviction. It ended up resolving with a $6 million settlement. Uh, the company ended up hiring a criminologist to go through each and every single one of their job positions um, and had a hiring matrix, but that hiring matrix was not just, just the matrix, no bright line rules. Um, and then you had to conduct an individualized assessment. So you really wanna make sure that you learn from this, make sure that you understand if you do have a matrix or an adjudication hiring criteria that it does not have bright line rules, using words like review instead of ineligible for hire are gonna be very, very important. Um, making sure that you understand that you're doing this individualized assessment are gonna be important as well. Now, in addition to this consent decree with the EEOC, there, now remember, that's guidance. So it doesn't have the full force and effect of the law. However, you should treat it as such. There are then state and local actual statutes that are law, uh, both in states, counties, and cities throughout the country who have now specifically said, you must do an individualized assessment. Period, end of story. It's not a nice to have. Um, it's not just an EEOC or disparate impact claim, although those are very important, but this is a statutory requirement under the law. So you'll see some of these different states, New York, Article 23A, that's through the entire state of New York. You also have the New York Fair Chance Act um, and the LA Fair Chance Act that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, California has a requirement that you do an individualized assessment. Um, Austin, Texas, Massachusetts, Portland, Oregon, among many others. So you'll see this is throughout the country. It's not just one area. Um, some of these um, adopt the EEOC factors. Some are similar, some add some, some take away. Um, really, New York Article 23A was the impetus for the individualized assessment under the EEOC. Um, and so you really want to make sure that, you know, you're looking at these different assessments to understand what you have to do under the law, because it's a new type of claim that we are seeing on a pattern and practice discrimination basis. Um, and again, New York City and LA have the Fair Chance Act form. They are perhaps the most um, complex analysis that you have to do. You have to provide a copy of that written document and your analysis to the individual. Um, and in LA, for example, you have to actually give it to them. And if they give you more information, you have to give it to them again. Uh, it's very, very particular, very nuanced, and you need to understand that. Um, and again, in, in Wisconsin, you have to have it. It has to be, the conviction has to be substantially job related. These are just a few. There's many, many others of these. So what does that mean from a best practice perspective? Um, you know, obviously, you know, these are very, very challenging things. So you want to make sure that you get good legal advice and, and understand that you, people who are making these decisions know these parameters. Um, the EEOC has basically said, you know, look, um, arrest records are per se violation. Um, that's per se disparate impact. Um, there's a difference between an arrest, though, where the arrest, the person was not convicted and it was dismissed versus something that's actually pending. Um, and so the EEOC guidance, and frankly, many states say if something is pending, somebody was arrested last week, for example, and they have another court date, that that actually might be able to be taken into consideration. Even California actually uh, recently had new regulations to their law that talked about whether or not you could use pending records um, in making an employment decision. Um, and so be very careful about understanding arrests versus convicted, right? Innocent until proven guilty. Um, felonies versus misdemeanors. You know, many misdemeanors are minor crimes. It may still very much be important to you depending on the job. But for example, if it's not job related or consistent with business necessity, meaning if somebody's driving and they have a DUI or driving offense, does that really matter to you, um, for example? Or if somebody has a, um, a minor possession charge, for example, 
and now uh, you know recreational marijuana is legal in the state now maybe that doesn't matter right depending on if they're not operating heavy machinery or or for example those types of things um you know oftentimes what we hear um people ask is well how far back can i look for convictions and how far back can i can i look can i go more than seven years can i not um and the seven year issue is you know we, we actually thought frankly that um the euc might come out with when they came out with their guidance set that the seven year date um they might talk about it but really they don't have the jurisdiction to do that which is why they didn't um but the eeoc did opine that at some point in time um someone is less likely to recidivate they they cited studies on this recidivate basically means engage in that same type of bad behavior so someone is less likely to have that same poor behavior or judgment at somewhere close enough to that seven year mark that um that's why many states um have adopted that seven year mark and frankly this is a holdover from the fair credit reporting act it used to be many years ago that a background screening company could not report any conviction over seven years old now they can report information over seven years old except in certain states like california and uh, massachusetts and others based on salary threshold so understand that you do know you do need to understand uh, there are certain places where you can't go back more than seven years where you can't go back more than 10 years um and so you want to make sure that you work with your background screening company to make sure you know what you're getting and you know what you're allowed to utilize when you're making these decisions as well it's very complex and it's certainly not easy um the next piece we're going to talk about is ban the box and we did talk a little bit about this in our earlier session but Remember, the ban the box is really a situation of whether or not you're allowed to ask about that criminal history question. How does that interplay with the EEOC guidance and these different individualized assessment rules? To me, it is a gift because if you ask post-conditional offer in an appropriate legal question, you now have the opportunity for the person to provide you with all the information you need to do an individualized assessment. So for example, if you ask, have you ever been convicted of a crime and you have all the caveats and it's a really appropriate question and there's many many of those caveats um and the person says yes don't stop there right you want to know obviously what the crime was when it was where it was but then you can ask those individualized assessment questions right what were the facts and circumstances surrounding the offense how old were you at the time of the offense have you worked before or after do you have references for example to do your analysis of whether or not the person actually was um, that whether that conviction is truly related to their ability to perform that job or not um, and again there are some very specific requirements that you have to comply with in order to um, not have litigation in this area um, we do see new litigation in this area where people are not complying with those fair chance act laws um the the ag's offices the attorneys generals are uh, bringing these claims um much more frequently specifically in new york we've seen some in california um we've seen some in the state of washington and some other states so understand that um the the human rights commissions as well as the attorneys generals are really um, very much still focused on this issue as well so let's go and talk a little bit about key takeaways before we get to some questions. Um, number one, make sure that you only inquire about criminal history after conditional offer of employment if you want to have the one size fits all um, everywhere EEOC guidance and ban the box laws um, that you're compliant with that. Only ask about convictions because arrests are per se discriminatory um, under EEOC guidance. Uh, for example, they're also potentially violative of other state laws like Illinois and others. Uh, don't ask about sealed, expunged, restricted, juvenile, pardoned, impounded criminal records. Those are going to be illegal in many, many jurisdictions. Have a written policy um, and, and make sure you follow that policy. You know, there may be aberrations and people may make mistakes, but this goes to this situation and question of willfulness, right? So make sure you have a written policy to review, you know, have that policy, make sure it says what you're actually doing. It's always helpful. Um, review those policies on a regular basis. Review your employment applications to make sure you're not running foul of those ban the box rules. Make sure you're reviewing your procedures to make sure that you're 
complying with those complexities of those fair chance laws, the individualized assessment states, um, any time that you have to provide different things in the adverse action letters, for example, um, and make sure that you monitor legal developments. There's very, you know, lots of changes and we see this happening um, quite often. So keep abreast of those different items to make sure that you're not left behind. The other thing and the sort of last takeaways um, is really make sure that you're dealing with training your managers and recruiters um, in terms of making sure that you have the, the right people in this centralized location. Um, um, turning off the auto rejection letters, for example, if you have an ATS system, um, making sure you understand where the person's working and where the person's living. You should always know the position location so that you can apply the relevant state and local law notices because frankly, where they live or where they work is where they could potentially file a lawsuit. You wanna be really um, careful about that. Keep abreast and understand that ban the box laws, they are changing quite often and we they're not stopping. Um, and last but not least, um, really consider not allowing people to start before the check is done. We talked really at length about that um, and all the reasons why that's important to do. That's how you're gonna stay out of litigation. Um, we're obviously here to defend you if you get into it, but we want to, you know, one ounce of uh, prevention is, is, is worth a, what's the saying? An ounce of prevention is worth something more than a cure. I forget the saying, but you know what I'm saying. Um, so um, with that, I'm going to turn it over and we'll open it up for some questions. I believe it's a pound of cure. Okay, thank you. Sam. Of course, happy to help. Thank you again, Pam. That was absolutely great information. I know our attendees certainly will benefit from it. Um, a couple of questions have come in. Just some real quick housekeeping before we get to that, guys. Uh, if you have questions, put them down in the Q&A section. We'll answer as many as we can before we run out of time here. If you'd like a copy of the presentation, it's under the materials link at the bottom right. Um, Pam, first question, do I need to follow FCRA requirements for internal promotions? Uh, it depends whether or not you're running a background check on that individual. So if you're going to use a third-party background check um, or, or utilize um, any background check, a previous one or getting a new one, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, am I under any FCRA responsibilities for a temp to hire employee that I decided not to hire? Yeah, so it really depends here. If, if it's a temp to hire, so if the person is a temporary worker that is working and you are, um, they've applied, for example, to a position, and now you have undergone and taken a background check, right? They're like, no, they're the same as any other um, applicant. Um, and so you'd follow exactly the same responsibilities that you would um, for any um, applicant, whether or not they had been uh, performing temporary services or not. If, however, you've got a temporary worker and, they, and you are asking your staffing company to run the background checks, it's going to be a little bit of a different situation um, because um, generally speaking, the, the staffing company, it's going to be the staffing company's employee potentially. Um, and if they're making the decision, um, you know, whoever runs the background check is required to comply with the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, that is a whole nother sort of uh, one to two hour webinar about uh, temp to firm. Um, but generally speaking, the, the answer is if you're running the background check, you have to comply. Gotcha. Um, is an applicant tracking system responsible for FCRA compliance? Uh, generally speaking, no. An applicant tracking system is a tool, right? Like, like a, just like I use email or, or Microsoft Word or something like that. It's a tool. Um, and so the answer is no. You are going to be responsible as an employer for um, making sure that you are uh, compliant with the, your obligations under the law. Okay. Here's an interesting one. Can I put job requirements, e.g. no felonies or no DUIs on the job offer or on the job posting? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And the answer is um, be very, very, very careful about doing so. So um, number one, right, felons need not apply, right? Or no criminal history allowed. That goes directly um, in the face of that EEOC criminal history guidance we were talking about. Um, and frankly, that's where uh, we see a lot of the EEOC claims coming from. Um, we talked about two, two issues in that question were one um, on the application and two on the job posting. Um, and so remember, if you are in a state that has banned the box restrictions, um, so for example, 
um, you are in a, a state wherein you're not allowed to ask about criminal history uh, before conditional offer of employment, saying those things potentially would be a per se violation. So definitely, for example, in New York City, having anything on a job posting that even mentions a background check could be violative. So you want to be really careful. We recommend across the board that you take out any um, mention of a criminal background check or of a background check on any job postings and in any employment application. Okay. Um, do I need to keep a history of applications that we deny via adverse action? Yeah, so it's a, it's a good idea to keep a record of those to make sure that you, you know, if you are sued, for example, that you can show compliance with the law, right? So it's a, it, there's twofold. One, it's a good idea to keep that record keeping requirement and some, frankly, in some jurisdictions you must. So like, for example, um, in Los Angeles, there's very specific record keeping requirements. Um, under the FCRA, there's not a requirement that you keep the adverse action letter, but it's a good idea that you do so. Um, and you generally want to keep that for at least a period of two years. Okay. Um, do I determine the need for an individual assessment, individualized assessment, or is there a list of exceptions? Yeah. So when I was talking about the criminal history guidance before, I mean, generally speaking, the answer is you should always do an individualized assessment. Um, to comply with the EEOC guidance, um, number one. And then again, there's very, very many different um, jurisdictions that also require it. So the best practice is you should always do an individualized assessment if you're thinking about taking action in whole or in part on, um, on criminal history, right? If you're going to hire the person, you know, potentially you don't need to do an individualized assessment because you've already decided to hire the person. Perfect. And uh, this will be the last question because uh, I know we're tight on time here. Any, are there any state by state uh, back, are state by state background screening policies okay or should it be a single countrywide policy that my company incorporates? Yeah, so this is, a, this is a, it's a good question. Um, and I think the answer is for consistency, you generally want to make sure that you have a consistent policy, um, a nationwide policy, um, but it could be, for example, that you can, your nationwide policies, you're gonna do an individualized assessment on everyone and you're gonna comply with whatever state or local law there is, for example. Um, so for example, in California, you're not gonna get any conviction information that's back more than seven years, regardless of any salary, you're never gonna get it. Um, I should say never, you're, you're hardly ever gonna get it unless you're a very, very specific regulated entity, but, but most often than not, you're not gonna get it. But for example, in Illinois, where I am, you can get criminal history uh, information going back 10 years. Um, so you may have a determination as a nationwide employer that you say, you know what, we're only gonna consider information going back seven years so that we can be consistent across the board. Awesome. Hey, Pam, thank you so much again for spending a little bit of time with us. Um, extremely impactful information. Thank you again for being here. Any final words before we go? No, I just, uh, if anyone needs any help, please feel free to reach out with questions and certainly appreciate the opportunity to be with everyone today. Perfect. And, and hopefully next year, Pam, we're doing this in person in the same room together. So thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we hope to see you in our next session. Have a great day. Thanks.